a network operating system. The goals or objectives for this training are to have students be able to explain the purpose of Cisco IOS, explain how to access and navigate Cisco IOS to configure network devices, describe the command structure of Cisco IOS software, how to configure host names on a Cisco IOS device using the command line interface, using Cisco IOS commands to limit access to device configurations, and using Cisco IOS commands to save the running configuration, also explaining how devices communicate across network media and configuring a host device with an IP address. And then finally verifying that the two end devices um, are connected and communicating. So kind of a cool chapter we get to get into actually applying some skills and configuring equipment. Let's get started. So what is iOS? iOS stands for Internet Work Operating System, and many devices, all computerized devices, from your cell phone to your iWatch to a computer to even your car, have an operating system. And an operating system is specialized software that enables the hardware to do what you want to do. Hardware would be keyboards, mice, monitors, you know, things like that. And in this case, we have different operating systems for different types of things. For end users, those would be PCs, laptops, phones, you have an end user operating system that is designed to do things for the human being, for the end user. And then specialized devices like switches, routers, wireless access points, and firewalls will also have operating systems, but they're typically designed uh, to work on those inter-networking devices, and so they help move traffic to or from their destination. And so iOS is simply a collection of different network operating systems used on various Cisco devices. An operating system comes in several different types. Um, an operating system may have what's called a GUI, a graphical user interface. That's what we're used to with Windows. That would involve a mouse and pointing and clicking, and you would have graphical representation for things like folders and files. Other operating systems will use a command line interface, or CLI, which allows you to type commands, typically at a black or green or blue screen. And those commands then uh, do the same thing, essentially, that you would do in a graphical user interface, but it would be command line. Typically, a command line interface operating system is smaller and lighter weight, so it uses less um, RAM and less hard drive storage and can typically be faster because it doesn't have to support all the graphics that a GUI uh, requires. Operating systems also work in a shell where the shell is the outer layer that the user interacts with and the shell then communicates down to the kernel and the kernel is the software layer that communicates down to the hardware. Purpose of an OS, like a PC operating system like Windows 8, soon to come Windows 10 and of course OS X on a Mac. They perform the functions of allowing you to use a mouse for input, allowing you to view output in a very graphical, colorful way. And um, on a switch or router, you would want to be able to configure the interfaces, the ports, to allow traffic in and out and allow the device to move traffic throughout the network. All equipment comes with an OS. Typically, like if you buy a PC or you buy a phone or you buy a router or switch, they're going to come with a default operating system. And these are usually upgradable. And so if you want additional features or a newer version, you can upgrade that operating system to get those. Cisco stores their operating system on Flash. This is uh, in a computer, you might call this SSD um, or uh, like a USB thumbstick is an example of flash. Flash is a non-volatile storage. So unlike a hard drive, hard drives have a lot of moving parts, but they're much larger, so you can store a lot of information. An SSD or flash is typically smaller in size, um, but doesn't have um, the problems. It's not magnetic, so it doesn't have to worry about magnetic field damage, and it doesn't have a lot of moving parts. In fact, there's no moving parts. And both the hard drive and flash are considered non-volatile, meaning when you turn the power off, your information's still there. But you can, you can overwrite the information as often as needed. And 
In Cisco devices, the flash can hold more than one operating system. You can only use one at a time, but just like on a computer, if you've ever heard of the terminology dual boot, where you could have two operating systems and boot from one and then boot from the other and use one or the other, uh, you can do the same thing on a Cisco device and you could have two or three or four different operating systems and you could boot into different ones. Uh, typically, we do this when we're experimenting or testing a new operating system. We want to keep the old one on there for a while just to make sure we don't have problems. Obviously, if you have more flash, you can store more in it. So the size of flash here, this flash shown in the illustration is 64 megabytes. If you had 128 megabytes, you could store twice as much information. The flash in most Cisco devices is upgradable and you can um, just pull it out and insert a new one. The main functions of an operating system, you'll want to get these in your notes, would be to provide security, routing, quality of service, addressing, managing resources, and your interfaces. Those would be the ports that the data is traveling in and out of. Here is a look out of physically the outside of the chassis on a router, and you can see in the orange square the console ports. That's a special port for connecting your computer to so you can type your commands. Cisco IOS uses a command line or CLI interface, and these are the three methods that you can use to connect to the router. You could use a console cable, a special cable that goes in these special ports, and they connect to a serial port on your PC to allow you to send your keystrokes. That would be one method. A second method would be to use what we call in-band um, configuration, which would be Telnet or SSH, which is a protocol um, allowing you to send and receive uh, the commands, the keystrokes, right over the internet and right over your uh, production network. And then additionally, you could have an aux port on some devices, and that allows you to use a modem to connect remotely to the device um, through a, a dial-up phone. We're going to look at the console port. The console port is the only way you can initially configure a device. You need to connect through the console port for before you could use any of the other methods that I mentioned in the previous slide. The devices from Cisco come blank and they don't have a configuration, so there would be no way to connect through the other methods. You'll have to use a special cable. Cisco ships a special cable with each device uh, for the console port and you will need to connect the cable to a port on your PC. If you take a look um, to the left of the purple square, you'll see a USB console port. That's on some newer routers and switches, allows you to use a um, mini USB cable and connect that into the USB port on your PC because a lot of newer PCs don't have a DB9 serial port today. And these are the other methods that we can use to connect remotely to configure our device. If you're going to use any of these methods, you're going to need a terminal emulation program. A uh, modern PC is not a terminal, it's a full computer, and so we have to emulate the functionality of a terminal. A terminal was just a monitor and a keyboard. And to emulate a monitor, keyboard, a dumb terminal, we need to use special software. Here's a list of some of the software that you might choose. If you're in a Windows environment, you're predominantly going to use PuTTY. It's the student favorite is to use PuTTY. It's fast and light and pretty powerful. Let's talk about the different modes. Cisco operating system is a modal operating system, so it's a hierarchical system where different commands are typed at different prompts. In a non-modal system, you can type any command at any prompt. In a modal system, only certain commands can be issued at certain prompts. So the first mode is user exec. That's a limited prompt. Notice the caret at the end of the command, uh, of the prompt, of the command prompt. That caret, that greater than sign, is indicating that you're at user exec. That is a limited mode where you can only type very few things. It's restricted and it's a, a, um, a user mode. If you change modes to privileged exec, that's the administrator mode. And it's a more powerful prompt that allows you to do anything. And you'll see that the prompt changes from the caret to the pound sign. And from this pound sign prompt, 
you can uh, reboot the router, delete configs, move configs, do all of the management um, and maintenance that you would need to do. Now, if you want to configure the router, give it a name, uh, set up the interfaces, you have to go into a configuration mode. So that is a sub mode um, beneath the privileged exec. And you can see that here. The prompt is going to remain with the pound sign at the end, but with the addition of the word config, indicating I am now enabling configuration. So I can now start configuring the device. And you go into further and further sub prompts. At this point, if I want to configure a particular interface, I'll need to go into the sub prompt for that interface to be able to put interface specific settings. So for instance, if I want to put um, a network address and specific settings for one specific port on the device, I need to go into a prompt for that port. This is how you move from one mode to the other. You would type enable and the enable would move you from user exec to privileged exec. And if you type disable, it would remove move you back the other direction. You can see an example here of the types of commands you can type at the different prompts. This is not showing how you switch from prompt to prompt. This is just showing an example of the commands that would be typed at different prompts. This is how you change prompts. If you are at user exec and you want to go to privileged exec, you need to type enable. If you want to go from privileged exec back to user exec, type disable. And you can try that in Packet Tracer or in the lab when you're in our lab try these commands. You have many labs this chapter that are going to really help reinforce what I'm talking about. Here's again examples of the types of commands that could be typed at different prompts. The structure of commands would start with a prompt. You always have a prompt in the command line interface. After the prompt, you would type a command. After the command, you always put a space. And then sometimes you provide a keyword or argument for the command. So if the command was ping, ping says to send a test message. I have to tell it now with a keyword, I have to say where to send the message. So I would type ping space www.yahoo.com or ping space 192.168.10.5. So that would be the keyword or argument. I have to provide the command some information about what it is to do. In the lower example, you can see the same thing. Show is the command. The show command is a powerful command that shows us settings. But you can't just type show. There are many settings in the device. We have to tell it what type of settings we would like to see. In the example, we type show IP protocols. That is going to show us the IP settings. You can get a list of all of the commands several different ways. If you look in our syllabus, you'll see one of the optional recommended materials for this course is the command line reference. You can purchase that and it's a handheld book that makes it very easy to look up commands, find out what they do and how to use them. You can also get the same commands though online. Uh, Cisco has some white papers, some PDFs and some other places uh, throughout the internet where you can look up these commands. And if you um, run into a command, I do this all the time, I run into a command I'm not sure how to use, maybe I don't know what keyword or arguments are available to use with the command, or I'm unsure what the command does, I'm going to Google it. Uh, I know here in your instructions uh, in the stock PowerPoint, it tells you to go to cisco.com. I skip that step and usually just use Google. And if you type Cisco with the command after it, it usually brings up um, some really good resources on that command. You could go to Cisco.com, click on support and click through um, down into their reference guides and you could look up the command that way. That by the way is a great way if you wanna download their whole reference guide for all the commands. This is the example of using context sensitive help. One of the neat things in the Cisco command line interface is the ability to use a question mark. If you were to type CL question mark, 
it would be asking the router to tell you all the commands that start with CL. In the example here, clear and clock are the two commands that start with CL. If, however, I, I, I want to know what command comes after clock, I could type clock space question mark, and it would tell me what command went after clock. In the example they show, they type clock space set space question mark saying, what do I type after clock set? And it tells me that I need to provide the hour, minutes, and seconds. And then after I do that, I do a question mark to see what do I need to provide after that, and so on and so forth, until you have the entire command. Eventually, it will tell you to press return. If you type just clock set and you hit enter, the command line interface will tell you you didn't give it enough keywords or information to execute the command. The command was clock and you did not provide it enough information to do its job. So as you type, if you hit enter or return too early, it will just tell you that you've provided an incomplete command, then you'd have to retype that and usually use a question mark at the end to find out what you're missing, what to add. If you have an ambiguous command, as shown here, that's a message that says you haven't provided enough information. It doesn't know what that command is. So in other words, there's no command C. So you type to C and hit enter. It says ambiguous command. Ambiguous means unknown. Here, on the bottom example, we have typed a six and the router doesn't know what the six means. So it's saying invalid input detected at the caret marker. And it has provided a little caret there to point at the six to say, look, I understood what you were saying up until that caret. So it's saying clock and set in 1950.00 and 25 all made sense. It knew those, but it doesn't know what you meant by six. And so that helps you know from the feedback you get in these different types of um, messages from the router or switch, you can, as an admin, know what you did wrong and, and maybe know how to fix it. So you do get some helpful feedback from the device. These are some hotkeys and shortcuts. Really good to get these written down and practice them. Some of my favorites, tab is great because if you're typing, say I want to type clock, I can type CL and press tab and it will finish off the command for me. You could type uh, control R and that would redisplay a line. This is helpful if you were typing a line and a message popped up in the middle of what you were typing, the line would disappear. You could just press control R and it will reprint the last line you were typing. Again, very helpful if things pop up in the middle of what you were doing. Uh, a and Z, A goes to the beginning of the line and Z goes, um, E goes, sorry, E isn't up here, <laughs> A and E. Uh, a goes to the beginning of the line and E goes to the end of the line. So if you do control A, they'll move your cursor to the beginning of the line. This is helpful if you were typing a very long command or you're typing along and you're way over on the right side of the command there and you notice you've made a uh, syntax error back at the beginning of the line. You could hit the arrow key and arrow all the way back to the beginning to fix that error or you could just press control A and that'll move your cursor back to the very beginning of your, of your command line. So it's a helpful way to jump to the beginning and end of the line. Control Z is something different. That's a way to exit the configuration mode altogether. So if you're done configuring the device, a quick way out would be to hit control Z. You can of course use an up and down arrow and that'll actually cycle through all the commands you've typed before at that prompt. And so that's the history, the command history. And so if you've used a command in the past and you're like, oh yeah, I just typed that. I wonder, you know, I need to type it again. Instead of having to type the whole command out a second or third time, you can just hit the up and down arrows to bring back commands that you've typed in the past. By default, Cisco is going to remember the last 10 commands you typed, but you could change that with the history size command. You could set the history to hold a hundred commands or however many you want. And there's some other, other commands you have. Right, now notice here we have all show commands. This entire screen is show commands. These are the standard show commands we're gonna have you start with. And there are 50 or 60 different show commands. They show everything. You're learning just a few of them that show the different kinds of things that we might wanna look at as an administrator. 
So they're in the three key areas of RAM, which is where the operating system and the programs, RAM is our operating memory where everything lives. We're gonna to wanna to be able to look at what's in RAM and what it's doing. And those are the show commands that really help us understand that. And then I might wanna look at NVRAM. That's the uh, special area of flash where my commands are stored. So that's my backup commands. And I might want to know what I've saved there and uh, be able to look those over. And we have some commands to look at that. And the flash is, remember, like the hard drive. It's the SSD area. And what's there is your operating system and some other things. And then we have the physical interfaces. So just kind of learning what commands show us what in the iOS is important. So this is a good slide to copy into your notes as a reference. Show version is a terrific command. Uh, every operating system has a command or a, a click. In Windows, you right click on, um, you, you can right click on your My Computer and you can uh, bring up a sheet of what version of operating system is running and when it was out and what release it is. And that's what this is. This is telling me that I'm running 15.24 M1. Um, of the Cisco iOS. Now I'm running the 1900 series switch and you can see all kinds of information here about uh, it's a 1941 switch. It's been running for 41 minutes and I can just see all I've got the file name of my operating system. There's just tons of information there that's helpful to an admin. All right, that does the first section. Let's move on to getting basic. Getting basic means we're just going to try to build a basic network. We're going to take a couple switches, a couple PCs, plug them together, and get them to work. All right. So without names, it could be really frustrating to know which switch you were in. If you had a stack of switches in your company and you plugged into one of them to configure it, it could get confusing which switch you're in. So the first thing we like to do whenever we go in a new device is give it a name. This can be any name that starts with a letter, contains no spaces, and is 64 characters in length or less. And we can use dashes, and so typically give it a meaningful name. We call this name the host name. So here's some examples, sw-floor-3. Notice you can use uppercase and lowercase. And so this should tell me this is the switch for floor one, the switch for floor two, and the switch for floor three in this example. And you can see an example here of changing the host name. Notice when I first go into a blank switch, it's called switch. So all the switches in my company would be called switch. So the first task as an admin is to give the switch a unique name. And the name I've chosen to give it in this example is Atlanta HQ SW1 or Atlanta Headquarters Switch 1. The next thing you're going to want to do now that your switch has a unique name is you want to provide some security because you don't want anyone else to just waltz in your switch and start changing your configuration. So we're going to put some passwords on the various ways that folks can gain access to our device. We're going to set an enable password, which limits access to that privileged exec mode, which is the admin mode. We'll also use an enable secret password, which is an encrypted version of the enable password, a more secure version. We'll set a console password, which will prompt us now for a password every time we attach the console cable. We'll also set a VTY password, which limits access over Telnet or SSH, any kind of remote access. In our class, we'll only use the password Cisco or class, all lowercase. This will assist us in doing password resets and getting in if you forget to delete your configuration when you're done with labs. So you would start by typing enable to go from the user prompt to the privileged prompt, and then you would type configure terminal to move into the configuration mode, and then we'll type enable secret, and the secret password will be class and then you can test it. And again, you'll have a lab that you get to do this, so I will spend less time with these. This is setting your console and your remote access passwords. 
This is turning on password encryption so that those passwords are no longer in plain text. The next thing that we need to do now that we have given the device a host name and we've put passwords on the various ways to enter the device, we should put a banner message. This is a legal requirement and it's like a keep out sign on a property that says keep out private property. You need to have that as a notice to folks. Even though it's password protected, if they broke into our network, we'd have trouble prosecuting them because they didn't necessarily break in. We didn't tell them that this was a, a private device they weren't allowed to go into. So for legal reasons, please put a keep out message. You can, by the way, Google banner messages um, and find some really nice ones written by attorneys that are free to use all over the internet. Configuration files. Everything you type into the router is stored in a file. And we need to back that file up to our flash so that the file is available in case the power goes out. This is much like if you type a Word document, if you're typing uh, in the word processor and you decide that what you typed is pretty good, you want to hang on to it, you need to go up and click save, don't you? You want to go ahead and save that in a more meaningful way because you know if you don't, when the computer power cycles, you're going to lose everything you typed. So it's the same thing with the router switch. Once we type in our host name and our password and all these different things, we want to now save that so that it's there in case the power goes out or the router gets recycled. So we do that through the copy command. The running config is the configuration file that sits in RAM. Remember, RAM is the volatile memory that disappears when the power goes off. But as you type commands, they're stored in a file in RAM. We need to copy that file into startup, which is stored in NVRAM, which is non-volatile. It's one simple command, copy running config, startup config. And that would give you the to and from. And it says copy the running config to the startup config. And we can undo that if we decide we don't want to keep that file. We can type erase startup config and that will delete the file. We can also capture our text and save it in a notepad document. Another way to back up what you've done, uh, you may want to carry a copy of your config around on a thumb drive or have it stored on a computer so it's not even on the router or switch. So what we would do is from the terminal emulation program where we've typed in our config, we can go ahead and capture that text to a text file. Let's look at some address schemes. Every device on a network is going to need a number, a unique number that identifies it on the network. These are the numbers for this PC. This PC is given the identity 192.168.1.1. That would be the unique address assigned to this device. It's also been told where its doorway out of the network is. A doorway in networking is called a gateway. So our default gateway. So if this PC wanted to access the internet or other devices beyond its local network, it would need to go through that default gateway. Just like having exit signs in a building that show where the door out is, you notice that they don't put exit signs on doors to closets. They're on doors that go out. The default gateway is our exit door, and we need to identify it for our end devices. So we have a default gateway. Also, for human beings to use the network, human beings don't like all these numbers, so we like to type in names like yahoo.com. We don't want to have to type in the number, so we're going to need a DNS server. So you'll notice we've listed some different DNS servers so that when a human types a name in, it can be resolved to one of these numbers. This is similar to a phone directory for the internet. And a phone directory or phone book, you take someone's name and you look it up alphabetically and it would return the phone number for the individual or business. We use the same thing with DNS. You enter the name and the DNS server will return the unique network number for that device. Let's look at interfaces and ports. They come in all different shapes and sizes and they have different speeds. And ports might be wireless, they might be radio frequency, which is wireless, or they could be fiber optic cable, or they could be copper. They could come in a coaxial cable, which is similar to what's on the back of a television set, 
or they might be using uh, any number of other cables or connectors. Ethernet is a common one and often uses the RJ45 connector, which is a larger version of the connector that they used on the uh, telephone network. Here's an example of assigning a network address to a device. Here's an example of assigning network addresses to a PC. By default, most PCs are set to automatically obtain all of these settings but you have to have a special server called a DHCP server, which is dynamic host name server, which pulls uh, dynamically all the network settings for that host. And we don't probably have one of these um, set up for your labs because we want you to learn to type the settings in. So you're going to want to choose the use the following address so that you can manually enter the settings. But if you wanted to dynamically enter the settings, you would set your end device to obtain their IP addresses automatically. And this is one of the common messages that you might see when you do your labs. If we type the same IP address into more than one device, we will get this error message. Remember that devices have to have a unique address. If we use the same address twice, Windows will detect that and report the error informing us that we can no longer have a working network until we resolve this problem. Just like the postal system or the telephone network, you have to have a unique phone number for every user and you have to have a unique street address for every user in those examples. In a network environment, every end device must have a unique network address. Ping is a test utility that we use to send a test message across the network in order to verify that the other end is there. 127001 is a special network address which exists on every device. It's a local loop address, so essentially it allows you to test your own device, and it's testing to see if your device has network protocols installed. And that's shown in the orange box. If you uncheck the checkbox in the orange box, your ping would no longer work because you would have uninstalled or, or disabled your network protocols. Here's a look in the router or switch of what it looks like to look at the IP settings. Here is sending a test message on the network. And notice that we're getting a reply so we have some successful messages. We're at the summary for this chapter. We covered what an iOS is. We've covered how routers and switches support the same or similar operating system. Cisco uses very similar, if not identical, commands throughout their devices. And we've covered the main things you need to do in a basic configuration.